committee members, if you would take your seats. Uh, we're running a little late because caucus will run a little late. Uh, a couple of things. Uh, bill introductions from committee. Chair has one bill introduction. It's uh, uh, 2960, RS 2960. Has to do with uh, sports wagering. Without objection. Thank you. Other bill introductions from the audience? Seeing no bill introductions from the audience, I will close bill introductions. First uh, bill we're hearing today is House Bill 2722. If the revisor would give us an overview. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, this is a uh, Article 5 conventions uh, bill relating to uh, appointment of delegates and so on. You spent yesterday on the floor uh, arguing about the, uh, the <coughs> concurrent resolution dealing with this subject. Anyway, the bill... Uh, on page one, uh, section two is a definition section that defines uh, delegate, alternative delegate, Article Five uh, convention, and so on. I won't go through that. Section three on page one there uh, lists who can make appointments uh, of delegates. The uh, Speaker of uh, the House, President of the Senate, the Governor, and the Legislature uh, all make appointments. Uh, the term of these uh, delegates is the um, when the convention is called in the last day uh, that it, for final adjournment. Uh, there's a procedure for recall of de delegates in subsection uh, C on page 1. On page two, subsection E provides the Secretary of State shall certify in writing uh, who are the delegates to the convention. Section four deals with the oath they have to take. Uh, section four B provides that only delegates appointed by the legislature, uh, which would be two, uh, can actually vote. Um, it provides um, in subsection C on page two, a vote cast by a delegate on an unauthorized amendment or any other measure that's outside the scope uh, would be considered void. Section five provides that no delegate shall cast the final vote to approve uh, or adopt any proposed rule or constitutional amendment unless they were approved according to section six. Section six provides for the submission of the proposed rule or constitutional amendment uh, to the, the governor, the speaker of the house, the president of the Senate, and the attorney general, um, and provides that if the legislature is in session, then they have the ability uh, to approve or not. And the, uh, there would be a procedure where they, uh, the standing committees on federal and state affairs would con uh, consider these uh, rules or constitutional amendments and the legislature may adopt uh, any concurrent by concurrent resolution approving or rejecting uh, the um, rule or constitutional amendment. There's a procedure in there if the legislature is not in session, but the coordinating council determines that the, they should call a special session, they would ask the governor to call and if no special session is called within 30 days after then uh, submitted, then they would be considered approved. Um, anyway, I think that's the gist of it. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Representative Heiberger. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I may not have read this carefully enough, but uh, it looks like the two legislative appointed delegates get to, to decide the state vote in the convention. I don't see anything that states what happens when those delegates disagree. If they disagreed, there is, it's not covered by the bill. Thank you. For the questions of the revisor, seeing none. Thank you, Mike. Next up, uh, we have one proponent, uh, Representative Susan Estes. Good morning, ma'am. I'll have to limit you because we're going to try to hear two bills today. 
to thank about you very uh, much. to um, about three minutes and then questions. Thank you. This this bill came out because I was very uncomfortable with the constitutional convention and what could happen uh, in a runaway process and what could happen. Uh, once once a convention should be called. So this bill kind of addresses some of those concerns, but I also want to be very clear that this bill doesn't say, I believe X, Y, or Z will happen after a convention is called. I think both proponents and opponents of a convention have put a lot of research into their beliefs, and at the end of the day, I think we don't really know what will happen. But I thought it was important to have a process in place so that if one is called, um, the, the balanced budget, budget amendment folks uh, say that they're very close to having enough for a convention, that we have um, something prepared, and it also serves as a safety valve. If the supporters of the convention of states are correct and states get to decide, we in advance and dispassionately will have created a process um, that we can operate under. If the opponents of a convention turn out to be correct and uh, this, the Congress takes over the process. We will be forced to come back and have a mutual dialogue that says, what do we want to do about that? We believe that a state should determine these things, and therefore we want to either rescind our petition or we want to sue the federal government and say, no, states have the right to set the policy that you're attempting to do. Or maybe we like what um, Congress has set forth and we amend this bill to match it. But automatically just because uh, we would be out of sync with each other we would be forced to be intentional and have a discussion about that uh, representative Heiberger, to your question um, the bill is really an advise and consent and that's my i didn't like any of the answers i heard to a runaway convention that after a vote that's out of bounds has happened, uh, then we would call someone or threaten them with jail. That seemed reactive to me. So the advice and consent portions in section six uh, allow us to tell those delegates how we vote. And anytime one of them votes in a way that's contrary to what we've said, um, there is that section that says their vote is null and void. Um, so thank you. I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you. Questions for the proponent? Yes. Representative Reese. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Representative, good to see you here this morning. So, the state of Kansas, we would elect two delegates to attend the convention. Is that my understanding? So, all along, we've been hearing one delegate, one state, one delegate. What's, can you clarify that? No, I think that's part of what's up for debate. Um, some people have expressed a concern that states will get a vote based on population and not one state, one, one vote. Uh, even if we elect two people, one of them casts the vote, but having two people it kind of takes care of if someone is sick and so on. Did I answer your question? Well, yes, I guess. Thank you. Okay. Further questions of the conferee? Seeing none. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you all very much. We're going to move to the opponents. John Axtell, Kansas Campaign for Liberty. Good morning, sir. Uh, we, you have three minutes. Microphone. Microphone. If you'd push the button, uh, there's a button on the front. Uh, okay. All right, good. I've been muted before. Okay. Okay. Thank you, sir. First of all, is that it's Congress and not the states that will set the rules for the convention, and this is very clear. First, in Article 5, it says Congress shall call the convention, and in Article 1, Section 8, the last clause, it says Congress has the authority to write all laws to fill in the blanks, basically, that aren't already specified in the Constitution. So Congress will do this, but in a um, opinion cited yesterday on the House floor discussing HCR 5027, um, this article from the Congressional Research Service dated April 11, 2014 states that, quote, Congress has traditionally laid claim to broad responsibilities in connection with the convention, including setting the amount of time allotted to its deliberations, 
determining the number and selection process for its delegates, setting internal convention procedures, and including formulae for the allocation of votes among the states. Now, that would be a disastrous thing for Congress to do because I'm sure it's not going to be one state, one vote. Um, I have contentions with certain provisions of the bill as being impractical. How is a voided vote going to be voided? Okay, well, we have a superdelegate that stands and says, I'm sorry, that delegate, that vote is voided. Or will we come back to the convention days after the vote is cast and say, I'm sorry, that Kansas vote is voided? There's no way to prevent, there's no provision given in the bill for actually preventing a vote from being cast for an unauthorized amendment. There's no punishment for the delegate. There's no way to rescind that vote or void that vote immediately, which is the time frame when the convention would demand that that kind of response would be made. Two weeks later, three weeks later, and so on, that would not be appropriate. And furthermore, the review process includes one step that takes at as much as 30 days. Thank you. As much as 30 days, and that review process implicitly expects the convention to recess for that time while the Kansas uh, state of Kansas decides if a particular rule, proposed rule or proposed amendment is appropriate for the state of, or is a, an authorized amendment for the state of Kansas. I have these and other um, objections to the bill. There's more detail provided in my written testimony. I uh, urge you to vote against HB 2722 and I thank you for your consideration of my testimony and stand for questions. Thank you. Uh, I'll take questions at the end of the opponent. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Next up is Joanna Martin on WebEx. Joanna, are you on WebEx? I am, sir. I am, sir. Then you may go forward. You have three minutes. Thank you. Americans don't know civics, so they are easily deceived. That's why convention pushers get away with blatantly false assurances. I was going to mention four, but I'll just mention two. They told you the framers added the convention method of getting amendments to Article 5 so that when the feds violate the limits in the Constitution, we could rein them in by amending the Constitution. But that's not true. The framers never said such an absurd thing. They agreed that the purpose of amendments is to remedy defects in the Constitution. The issue was how would the amendments which were needed to fix the defects be proposed. Madison proposed that Congress alone have the power to propose amendments, but George Mason objected that no matter how oppressive a provision of the Constitution might prove to be, Congress might not, to, might not agree to amendments the people want. So it was moved to require a convention on the application of two-thirds of the states. Now, our framers knew that our Declaration of Independence recognizes that a people have the self-evident right to throw off their government and set up a new one, and thus have the right to meet and draft a new constitution, whether the convention method were in Article 5 or not. So the convention method was added to Article 5, and it provided a second way to get amendments to fix defects in the constitution. But... It also provided a way to get a new constitution under the pretext of just getting amendments. The Anti-Federalist hated the new constitution. So right after our constitution was ratified and the new government went into operation, the Anti-Federalist in Virginia filed an application for an Article 5 convention. And James Madison warned that those who secretly want to get rid of our constitution would push for a convention under the pretext of just getting amendments. That's what's going on today. A member of Mark Meckler's COS Legal Advisory Board has already co-authored a new constitution which grants massive new powers to a new federal government. And that is only one of several Propose new constitutions which are already out there, such as the Constitution for the of America. Number two, 
they told you an Article 5 convention is safe because state legislatures will choose and control the delegates. But that's not true. The testimony shows Congress decides how the delegates will be selected. You'll need to wrap up. Your three minutes is up. Thank you. Go ahead. Take another 30. Since preliminary right. preparations for conventions in the past, Congress has provided that the delegates would be elected in a number equal to the state's electoral votes. So California would get 55 delegates. Kansas would get six. And just as you cannot force your elected members of Congress to do your bidding, you will not have any control over elected delegates. Please understand, there is nothing in the Constitution which is... Thank you, ma'am. Your, your time is up. I gave you an additional 30 seconds. Thank you, Mr. Chief. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, please remain on the uh, WebEx in case there's questions. Next up will be our own Mike Hauser, Representative Hauser. I know it will be difficult, but you'll need to stay within the three-minute time period. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for your utmost confidence in me. Um, Mr. Chairman, I thank you and fellow community members for giving me this opportunity today. I'm not even where I stand on the Convention of States resolution in a convention, so we're not even going to go there, as that would be uh, probably considered redundant by many on this committee. What I am going to say is, and it will be redundant because we've talked about it before, the two previous speakers did. But I'm going to focus on that part. There is, you know, this, whoever authored this, I have no idea where the language came from because it did not come from the Constitution of the United States of America. There's not one shot, stroke, or letter of this in that document. So this is all purely speculation on to how it would be run if Congress would even allow the states to do so. Um, like I mentioned yesterday uh, in testimony at the well, the last time this happened was that we got within two, vote, two states, eight, uh, 1983, and I, there was 41 bills introduced to Congress of the United States dealing with delegate selection and the function of the convention. What makes you think it's going to be different today? I'm paraphrasing off of my written testimony just in order to keep time short. But I want to focus on, I understand what this is trying to do. You're trying to control delegates to the, to the convention. But I'm here to tell you that you're not going to be able to do that because once the delegates get to a convention, they're separate. They're not, they're not bound to this. They can say, take your, take your rules here. We're not going to, we're not going to abide by them. Just like in 1897, what, they, they went into an executive session. The delegates could do that at a convention like this, close the doors, go however they want. State won't know what's going on. There's no way that you can bind a delegate to one of these con conventions to what you're trying to do with this legislation today. To do so would be putting this body of legislators above the delegates, which are representative of the people of the state of Kansas. And as I've said many times before, the creature of the Kansas Constitution is the U.S. Constitution is a government. The creators are with the people. The creature cannot be greater than the creator. Therefore, the creature cannot tell the creator how to vote in a delegation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. We have one other uh, opponent. It's written only. Uh, Judy Keller, Citizens Against an Article 5 Convention. Uh, her written testimony is in your file. Questions for the opponents? Yes, Representative Miller, if you're directed to one of the opponents. Actually, it's, it, it's a request of staff. Um, the fiscal note refers to 17 states having approved the Article 5 convention. I think my friend from Salinas had 18 yesterday. We also had testimony that 
two states have recently rescinded. Could we get from research a current list of states that have ratified Article 5 Convention? Jordan, can you get that before we adjourn here today? I, I don't need it that quickly. But I'll get it out to all the committee. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Representative Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chair. That's for Mr. Uh, Representative Hauser. Okay. It, you know, many times I've heard this assertion that the delegates can get to a convention and begin their clandestine um, mission of beginning to rewrite a constitution. This is this has no standing of law under either what we're proposing here or what currently is written. It has no standing of law under the Constitution. So my question is, why wouldn't this clandestine group just get together otherwise and begin this? Why do they wait for a convention of states? Why don't they just call it themselves if that's what their intention is? Because they're not going to have a standing of law to do it under a convention of states either. It makes no sense to me. That question would be directed to Representative Hauser. Thank you. Representative Hauser. Well, Representative, those clandestine, I don't know where you're getting this clandestine language from. But if you will recall history, you say that this would never happen. In the very first Constitutional Convention back in 1897, it was, we were running under the Article of Confederation. There was a convention called to amend certain portions of this because some of the some people thought that it was uh, no longer or something. Well, they just say something needs to change. Okay. At the same time, those those delegates to that convention, and it is a convention, constitutional convention. Those delegates were given instructions by their representative states on what their intent was, yet, and this is history, you can look it up, on May 29th, 1897, or 17, I don't forgive me, it's early in the morning for days, but there was a letter penned more or less saying that they were going into executive session, and when they did so, they proceeded to do a gut and go on Article of Confederation, and well, that's how we have the, the Constitution that we have today. So don't tell me that I'm uh, an alarmist or a paranoid delusionist or whatever you want to call me. Um, I'm just looking at what history says, and history proves me right in this point. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. you uh, Representative Smith, for a second time. So I understand that, but under that, we were not operating under the Constitution. We, that was prior to the Constitution. This Convention of States is under Article 5 of the U.S. Constitution. My point is, if we're going to operate under Article 5 of the U.S. Constitution, it doesn't give any authority to rewrite itself. It gives authority to make amendments, propose amendments rather, not even make amendments or ratify amendments, but to propose amendments under Article 5, not rewrite the Constitution. You done? You you wish to? Yes, sir. I, I will agree with that. That's what this Article Five says. But however, we're dealing with something that's never happened before. There is no language in Article Five specifying that this 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 that or the other will happen. You show me that. You show me language in Article Five that describes the process of an Article Five convention, and I'll. Apologize for being wrong, I guess. And then I'll take an ice cream sandwich. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> that hadn't happened in a long time, but thank you much. I'm an ice cream sandwich guy. Thank you. We're going to move on. Uh, Representative Armberger. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my question is for Joanna Martin. Um, in your testimony and in your uh, oral testimony, you mentioned a new constitution yeah. that has been discussed or, or published. Where can we find that publishing that does worry me if a new constitution is um, out and that apparently seems to be the uh, what you're stating is is the plan of the con of the convention? 
I will send uh, the committee an email immediately after this meeting is over and uh, send you the links. They are online. I've got links to uh, five uh, proposed new constitutions, uh, which are already online. The New States Constitution, here's the proposed constitution for the New Socialist Republic in North America. The um, Council on Foreign Relations wants to move the United States into the North American Union. Here is the task force report which outlines what they will need for their new constitution. Uh, this is the progressive constitution, which has already been published. This is the libertarian constitution. And this so-called conservative constitution is the one written by Robert P. George, a board member uh, on Mark Meckler's legal advisory board. This so-called conservative constitution delegates massive new powers to the new federal government. Thank you. Yes, Next sir. question is Representative Penn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. If I may ask a question of Mr. Axtell, please. You may. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Axtell, for your testimony and appearing before us today. Uh, we heard your testimony on the, on the underlying bill that we talked about yesterday uh, and on your opposition to this bill as well. My question is simple. What is your exact proposed solution to what our citizens are saying is the reason that they want to call a convention of states? I hear the teardown. Tell me what your solution is, please. Well, that's an excellent question. Thank you for asking that. The solution is not proposing an Article 5 convention. It's not proposing trailer bills like this one. The solution is enforcing the Constitution. George Mason did not ask for Article 5 to be um, to include the second phrase, the second clause, for the purpose of reigning in a government that does not follow the Constitution. That was not the purpose of Article 5. The purpose of Article 5, and he, he says almost exactly this, is to, well, I am paraphrasing. He says it is to fix defects in the written Constitution, in the words Reigning in a government that does not follow the Constitution by adding words to the Constitution is akin to saying that gun-free signs should be made bigger, brighter, bolder. Stop signs should be made bigger. None of those things work without enforcement. Gun-free signs don't work unless there's another person with a gun in the room. Stop signs don't work unless there's a policeman sitting nearby. Speed limit signs don't work unless there's a policeman sitting nearby and statutes against murder and other things don't work without a gun or somebody that can use force. We need to enforce the Constitution on the elected officials. We need to do that by step by step. If the constitutional provision requiring gold and silver money only were in place and it, if it were enforced by the people, we could not have a fiat currency, a currency not backed by gold or silver, a currency that's printed with abandon, handed out to special interest, and is growing our debt by trillions of dollars almost on a monthly basis, a fiat currency that is unconstitutional. You're going to have to start a shorter answer. Or okay. Thank you. Well, this is a long question, but I honor, I will honor that. Thank you. So, so we need to enforce the Constitution. And we have been doing that. Kansas Campaign for Liberty has been doing that. We have been enforcing the Constitution here in this state at the local level, and the national organization has been enforcing it at the national level. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, question, uh, Representative Hoyt, last question. Oh, oh I'm sorry. How? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I had a question as well for uh, Mr. Axtell. So, thank you for being here. Uh, my question is, the Constitutional Convention of 1787. Yes. How many votes did each state get during that convention? I don't recall um, in that convention how many votes each state got. But if the question is, will they get the same number of votes 
again, the Congressional Research Service has stated very clearly that the um, Congress considers it their purview to, quote, set internal convention procedures, including formulae for allocation of votes among the states. And I have seen a bill that only made it through the U.S. Senate that, or I've seen of a bill that has only made it through the U.S. Senate that actually would have provided for delegates in a number consistent with your electoral college representation. Uh, Mr. Axtell, I appreciate, um, but I believe the correct answer is one, each state got one vote per state. Okay, thank you. I have no other questions. Thank you, sir. Anyone else wish to appear as a proponent or opponent or neutral on House Bill 2722? Seeing none, I will close the hearing on House Bill 2722 and will open the hearing on Senate Bill 34. Reviser, if you would. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, substitute for Senate Bill 34 deals with administrative rules and regulations. Uh, I will refer you to the supplemental note, which I think does a great job of summarizing the bill, which I will go through here in just a second. And I'm also going to plug a, uh, uh, a document that their legislative research department uh, puts together or put together about the administrative rule and regulation uh, process. Um, they have a number of, uh, of uh, kind of briefing papers that are excellent uh, on different topics, and this one uh, will hopefully save me from trying to explain the rule and regulation process in detail. But anyway, the bill itself, uh, it provides that all rules and regulations adopted by state agencies uh, shall be reviewed every five years in accordance with this section. Uh, that's section one. Section B provides that each state agency shall adopt rules and regulations that adopts that shall submit a report to the Joint Committee on Administrative Rules and Regulations on or before July 15th of the year that corresponds to the agency. Uh, there's a list of them in uh, subparagraph two in terms of the schedule for when their five-year review uh, would take place. And uh, the report would contain a summary of their review, the agency's review and evaluation of the rules and regulations, including a statement uh, for each rule and regulation as to whether it was necessary for implementation of the state law. Uh, subsection two, which goes on for about three pages is a schedule. Uh, there's a number of agencies listed for those that are scheduled for 2023. You look on page two, the agencies scheduled for 2024 and 2025. Uh, on page three, those scheduled for review for 2026. And uh, on page four, those scheduled for review for 2027. If the agency is not listed in all that, uh, then uh, once that they adopt rules and regulations, they have, they're have they on a five-year schedule as well. Um, the subsection D on the bottom of page four there provides that notwithstanding any other law, a rule and regulation may be adopted or maintained by a state agency only if the rule and regulation serves an identifiable public purpose to support the state law. Um, there is a uh, procedure for revoking uh, rules and regulations uh, that's provided in subsection uh, D of an amendment to 77.426. And um, with that, I will try and answer questions. Thank you. Questions for the reviser? Yes, Rep. Heiberger. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It seems to me we've had, in the past, we've had a uh, statute that requires review of regulations every five years. Is that still in effect? Uh, not, uh, I will let uh, maybe Jordan answer that question. He works with Rules and Regulations Committee. I think it's correct, but let me defer Jordan, that if you, question. If you would. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Representative Heiberger, could you please repeat your question? I'm sorry. Yes. In the past, we've had a, a statute that requires review of regulations every five years. Is that still in effect? I'm not aware of any required review of rules and regulations every five years. Um, I know the statute requires that proposed rules and regulations and um, uh, rules and regulations that are then rescinded, those are brought before our committee. Well, I know that in the past, every year we've had the, the bill to, we had to reaffirm the regulations that came up on the schedule every five years. I used to do this for KDHE, so apparently it's been revoked. If you need some time, if you can get it out to the committee this afternoon, it'd be helpful. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not aware of a statute that required that, but maybe that was something in the past that I just wasn't aware of. Okay, so, thank you. Thanks. Okay, we'll get that out, answer out to the committee. Uh, Jordan, I know I've drafted bills providing for a five-year right. review. I know this bill does anyway, that. Okay. This is not the first bill that this is. Okay. okay. Thank you. No other questions. I'll go straight to the proponents. Uh, first up is Elizabeth Patton with Americans for Prosperity. Uh, again, uh, Ms. Patton, I have to limit you to three minutes. <coughs> I will try to beat that three-minute mark for you all this morning. My name is Elizabeth Patton. I am the State Director for Americans for Prosperity Kansas. Uh, we're here today to testify in support of this bill. Uh, we think this is a great bill. It uh, came to us from the Senate where it was, here, I'm a little shorter than I thought I was, apologize, um, where it, it became a compromise uh, with folks, uh, agencies, where we think this achieves a few different things. It provides for some government efficiency for Kansas. It gives, uh, it creates basically an, an express lane for agencies to be able to remove regulations because, as we were discussing with folks, it is currently rather difficult to do so. And it also does require a, a review of regulations every five years, uh, which is a re really reasonable time frame, and it does not require a sunset. And that was another change that we made, and I'll let some of our other uh, conferees comment further on that. Uh, but in our view, um, this should be seen as uh, an economic development opportunity for our state. Um, it sets us on a path as another example of a way that we can improve our regulatory burden truly from the red tape perspective. Uh, so it allows agencies to remove regulations that they would like to remove in a more efficient process. Um, I would like to read to you uh, a quick quote from uh, Forbes article that came out recently that talks about the fact that while uh, states can't do a lot about inflation, what they can do uh, right now is have a more efficient regulatory process. Um, and by doing that, it has, in our view, um, a direct uh, impact on budgets. We've seen that in other states that have implemented similar legislation. Um, and here's the quote. Um, there's two that I want to read. That if we support widespread relief as a way to lower prices and expand economic opportunity, uh, we would be well on our way to succeeding. And then this says, um, if Kansas reformed its regulatory environment, it would cause cut costs for consumers and expand opportunities for entrepreneurs both today and long after inflation has passed. States that create similar environments in their states will generate enduring economic prosperity. So that's what I'll leave you with today is that we believe this bill um, is the um, second piece to what we see as a significant puzzle for Kansas to generate enduring economic prosperity for our state. And with that, I'd be happy to stand for questions. Thank you. Next up would be... Uh... Eric Stafford, Kansas Chamber. Good morning, sir, and welcome to Fed and State. Good morning, committee. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for the opportunity to testify in support of Senate Bill 34. Um, as Elizabeth said, this was uh, a bill that has turned into um, something different than what it originally was. Um, it was a, a five-year sunset, and even some industry groups had some concern that um, what would happen if, you know, we were under KDHE and those rules were never renewed and we were all of a sudden under EPA. Uh, that wouldn't be good in their view. So uh, took, in, took that feedback. Um, this fall we had, we've worked uh, closely with Mercatus Center um, and uh, some of their folks who focus um, 
man, they love rules and regulations. Um, well, they love studying them, I should say. They don't love them. They like minimizing them. Um, but they, they did a study, several studies in Kansas and found that we have 71,000 regulations, um, which isn't the most, uh, isn't the least, um, but we're, we're in decent shape, but there's always room for improvement. And they listed about seven or eight things that Kansas can pursue, uh, one of those being a periodic review, uh, which is what Senate Bill 34 has turned into. Uh, but another recommendation is a fast track repeal, which was one of the amendments that the Senate added, which is the later provisions uh, there on, um, oh, let me get to uh, section D1 um, of the bill on page five. Um, where you start getting into the uh, ability for agencies to repeal outdated or unused regulations in a more efficient manner. So uh, the, the purpose of this bill is we've had a focus in conversations with legislators this year. Uh, we've, one of our areas of focus is regulatory reform. Senate Bill 34 is a part of those. The constitutional amendment that the House passed a week or two ago is another one. So uh, that constitutional amendment just passed the Senate Judiciary Committee yesterday. We hope to have that on the floor hopefully next week in the Senate. So um, I think between this bill and that constitutional amendment, those are really good changes for our rule and red climate in the state of Kansas. And uh, we would uh, appreciate your support of this bill. And I'm happy to answer any questions at the appropriate time. Thank you. Uh, committee, I would direct your attention to the written proponents, uh, Kansas Grain and Feed, uh, Kansas Cooperative Council, and the Kansas Livestock Association are proponents. As with that, we'll take questions. Yes. Mr. Chairman, if I didn't have you listed, do you wish to, Randy? You, you bet. Yeah, Randy Stuckey, Kansas Grain and Feed Association, Kansas Agribusiness Retailers, and Renew Kansas. We did submit written testimony. I had to be another uh, committee this morning and didn't think that I might be, be here for the, the testimony. So thank you for giving me just a couple minutes. Um, as uh, Mr. Stafford indicated, the, uh, the bill was substantially amended in the Senate. Now, as it was introduced, uh, we were not able to stand in support of Senate Bill 34 because it was a mandatory repeal every five years. And as, as Mr. Stafford indicated, you know, for, for folks like our industries who are highly regulated, and agribusiness is a highly regulated industry, both the grain elevators and ag retailers, and um, we prefer our, you know, being regulated by our state partners, the KDHE and the KDA. And um, if, you know, the, the bill were to re repeal all those regulations and we had to defer to the the federal agencies, that would not put us in a good place. So for that reason, we, we worked with the other proponents of the bill to have this be a review every five years. I think that's a very reasonable approach and probably a necessary approach. And so um, that, that amendment was put on Senate Bill 34. And so we stand in full support of Senate Bill 34 as amended. So thank you for the opportunity to speak this morning. Thank you, sir. Uh, now we will take questions of the proponents. Yes, Representative Heiberger, if you'll identify who you would like. A uh, question for Mr. Stafford, please. Yes, Mr. Stafford, if you'd be so kind. Good morning. Yeah, thanks for being here. Uh, this uh, reminds me of the Office of the Repealer under the previous administration. Do you remember, you recall that? Yes, sir. You recall how many statutes the Office of the Repealer proposed repealing? Um, no, but we were, I, I don't remember exactly, I know we were asked to hold some uh, hearings across the state uh, with that office um, and the business community to see, you know, they wanted to hear firsthand, you know, what regulations were problematic. Um, the outside of environmental, largely those that were brought forward were federally, they are federal in nature. Um, there were some, um, but... Um, again, I think it's more on the uh, industrial environmental side um, where you see a lot of the, and the Mercatus report that they, if you, if you Google Mercatus, Kansas regulations, you'll find the report. They break down what agencies have the most regulations uh, in the state and, and their data would reflect that. So uh, there are some areas of concern. I think, I think this is different. Um, this is more of a, of a proactive um, approach for agencies to say, okay, we're, you know, we don't need these anymore. Um, but um, is it a little bit more work on their end? Yeah. Um, but uh, to your point, yeah, I mean, we, we acknowledge a lot of the recommendations back then were, were federal, but there's still some, some areas of, uh, of plenty of oversight here at the state level. Yes, go ahead. 
to the floor. Uh, I just want to point out the revisor I pointed out the error in my previous assertion about the repeal. I was thinking of the statute that required review of open records exceptions every five years. So thank you. Yes, we do do that every year, the open records. Further questions of the proponents? Seeing none, I will go to the opponents. Brian Vasquez, Kansas Department of Health and Environment. Good morning, sir, and welcome to uh, Fed State. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, excuse me, wrong forum. Um, thank you, Chairman Parker. Uh, I'm Brian Vasquez. I'm General Counsel for the Kansas Department of Health and Environment. Um, I'm providing some oppositional testimony, but in fairness, it's probably more in the nature of questions. Uh, I provided some written testimony, but to summarize two issues. One is the scope. The way the language is written right now, it talks about state law. And this has already been highlighted by some of the comments made already. Um, environmental regulations were one that were mentioned um, between Representative Heiberger and, and some of the others. Uh, let me bring another one to the committee's attention. We have an agreement with the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Uh, it's actually required by, by state law, um, KSA 48-1601. It required us to actually engage in radiation control using federal guidelines. Uh, those particular regulations we currently have are about 300. Uh, they are heavily controlled by the NRC. To be able to change those or review them and solely base it upon state law probably is going to be a stretch. Um, whether or not there is a certain level of radiation for a particular element, um, quite frankly, there's nothing in state law that's going to deal with that. So the question really is, is what's the exact scope that is meant by this piece of legislation? If it is solely based upon items that are pure state law, then that probably is not as heavy of a lift if we were going to review all regulations. An example of a regulation that is almost pure state law, KDHE has a requirement out of KSA 17-1324 to review and control the construction of mausoleums. And we have nine regulations at KAR 28-9 uh, to, to deal with the construction of mausoleums. That's clearly, I believe, within a state ambit and, and certainly something that I think would fit within this language. The second part is the cost. If I was going to review or the agency is going to review all of the KDHE regulations and staff estimate somewhere between two and 3,000, because remember, KDHE covers not only, thank you, uh, and I'll be quick, um, not only covers the Medicaid program, but also covers public health, but also covers environment. Uh, we would estimate that we would need a minimum of, of probably 20 to 50 new staff members to do the five-year review. And it's not just a five-year review. For every regulation that is passed after July 1st, 2022, that sets its own five-year schedule. So it really becomes almost a constant review once this is fully implemented. With a spike every five years, KDHE begins in, in 2024. Thank you, and I, I will reserve myself for any questions. Thank you. Uh, I have you listed as the only opponent, so we'll take questions now. Uh, questions of the conferee? Yes, Representative Penn. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Sir, uh, for Mr. Vasquez, just one quick question. Uh, when this was at the Senate or here today, could you let the committee know if you've worked with, uh, could you let the committee know if you've worked uh, with the proponents to bring amendment language that either carves out or um, gives some kind of deconfliction for those areas that you say, like the NRC, uh, that's obviously within federal footprint, uh, that, that so it doesn't affect you. Do you have any uh, compromise or any language that you propose with that? And and to be fair, I'm, uh, 
typical attorney, I'm just maybe the mouthpiece here. So I'm probably not the person who needs to make that, that sort of a policy decision. But I would certainly be glad to communicate that back to our leadership. But yes, that is a, a something that I think we would be willing to, to consider because I think as Representative Heiberger and I think several have mentioned, um, not just Nuclear Regulatory Commission, there are probably about 90 regulations dealing only with water and water and environment. Thank you. Further questions? Yes, Representative Penn. And, and thank you, Mr. Chairman, for uh, allowing me. Uh, when you go to your costs, sir, you say that you need a uh, minimum of 20 personnel to do this review with the spikes in the ebb and flow. If regulation is decreased, uh, would you still need that much o uh, overhead and no, that many personnel? Well, that, and I'm hesitating, and I'll tell you why. It's, it's, it's um, uh, probably about every 16 to 18 months, we get something from the NRC saying, we want you to change this or that. And so, if we start on the process of doing too much revocation, we run into maybe issues as to whether or not we would be able to cooperate with that federal entity. And, and it also becomes a fiscal issue uh, because even though we may have a cooperative agreement, quite frankly, the agency brings down federal money that helps pay for some of the FTEs. Um, classic example is quite frankly, the Medicaid program. Uh, there's probably about 200 regulations that cover Kansas regulations that cover the Medicaid program and and we can pull down 50% federal match for administrative duties and and and, and other items so it, it needs it, it's something that I would think needs to be careful and, and candidly I probably personally don't have an issue with reviewing these regulations I think it is important to do it's just that it's it's like everything else anymore in this world. You may do something over here and, and literally have a butterfly effect somewhere else. Thank you. Uh, did you offer this testimony to the Senate when they heard this bill? I'm sorry, sir. Did you offer your testimony to the Senate when the Senate heard the bill? The no, I, I, I didn't. I, I, I was asked to actually prepare this testimony last week, so no, I wasn't involved with the, the original Senate version. Thank you. Uh, further questions? Yes, Representative Howe. Thank, thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, could you tell me uh, how many employees the KDHE currently has? How many employees the KDHE currently has? Just a rough ballpark is fine. Um, I, I had uh, Leo Henning, who is the Director of Environment, say, oh, 3,000 plus. Uh, I had Ashley Goss, uh, who is uh, public health, at more likely 2,000. Um, it, it's, I know I, have, I don't have an exact count. Maybe some of the other may have an exact count. It, it is, it's not small. Okay. Thank you. For the questions, I would know if the committee, uh, Connie has emailed you the question that was asked earlier by Representative Miller about the number of states that have passed the COS. So you should be getting that in your email. We have a couple of neutrals, David Fry, Kansas Behavior Science Regulatory Board. Good morning, sir. Again, you have three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, my name is David Fry. I'm the Executive Director for the Kansas Behavioral Sciences Regulatory Board. And I appreciate the opportunity to speak just a couple comments to you this morning. Uh, I've been with the BSRB for about a little over the last year. And as executive director, uh, this is the agency that licenses most of the state's mental health professionals, including seven different professions. Um, and we uh, currently are a public protection agency. We value the importance of having regulatory language that is both current and accurate. Uh, in fact, over the last year, our board has spent a lot of time looking at our regulations and statutes overseeing uh, licensing, education, and supervision. We have just begun the process of looking at our unprofessional conduct regulations to recommend changes or go forward with regulations or suggest statutory changes. Uh, but the reason that I wanted to talk to you today and the reason the board had concerns, we are a small agency. Uh, we have nine employees, including myself, and our primary mission as a public protection agency is to ensure that professionals are licensed and, and uh, complaints are investigated in a timely manner. And we are are doing our best to try to improve that process and make sure the individuals are licensed more quickly 
and we can investigate those complaints and resolve those in a quicker manner. Um, however, um, when we have additional responsibilities like this bill would add, um, it would uh, cause us to reallocate staff time from their existing responsibilities for this reporting requirement. And so our, our board wanted to relay our concerns uh, about this additional responsibility and also to let you know that we value the importance of what the bill is calling for. We have a, a plan in place. We have an advisory committee for each of the professions that assist the work of the board in reviewing the regulations and statutes. And so with that, we would respectfully request uh, an amendment to the bill to uh, essentially carve out our agency and allow us to do our own internal uh, review of our regulations and statutes and to submit those for changes as needed. Uh, but I'd be happy to stand for any questions at the appropriate time. Thank you. Uh, I will take the other neutral and then we'll look to go to questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. David. Uh, Help me out here. Brock, Brockett? James. <coughs> James, are you on WebEx? James? Um, sorry, sorry. Please, please go forward. You have three minutes. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Uh, my name is James Broll. I'm a senior research fellow at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. I'm also a adjunct professor of law at the Antonin Scalia Law School. So SB 34, as we've heard, it establishes a five-year review process for regulations and creates a fast-track process for regulations identified as revocable. Uh, I recently conducted a review of all 50 states' Administrative Procedure Acts, and I identified just eight states in the nation that lack some systematic process for reviewing their existing regulations. Kansas is one of those eight states. So 42 other states do find the time and resources to review their regulations. Uh, it is true that there might, this might involve a kind of culture change at agencies where rather than just focus on writing regulations, uh, they have to become more of a managers of a portfolio of rules where they're constantly going back and looking back at the regulations that are, exist. But I, I believe this is a healthy thing. There can be some resistance to this at agencies at first. But in my experience, uh, once this process gets underway, agencies actually like it. They find it's helpful to go back and review their regulations and they, they find the resources to do so. Um, the purpose of periodic review is simple, to just to determine whether regulations are working, whether they achieve their objectives. Regulations have unintended consequences. Um, their impacts can differ from how they were intended. Uh, before they were put into effect. And if you never go back and review regulations, then there's no reason to believe that they're actually achieving their objectives. And so these reviews can also help improve the design of new regulations. If you learn what worked and what didn't in the past, that helps you design regulations going forward. Um, a fast track process for eliminating regulations that are identified as obsolete or outdated is also important because this identifies it addresses an asymmetry in the rulemaking process, which is that regulations create constituencies when they're put into a place and removing them often removes a privilege that the government has bestowed upon some favored interest group. And so it, very often industry or special interests of various kinds will, will fight to keep regulations in place. Um, and so it's easier to add rules than it is to take them away very often. And so creating a fast track process kind of levels the playing field. And so these two, these two changes, adding a periodic review process and creating a fast track process for removing outdated regulations, they may seem modest, but they actually have the potential to really usher in a sea change in the regulatory mindset in Kansas. So regulators would be committing to determining whether regulations are working, whether they're achieving their objectives, rather than just assuming that regulations are working. This is a powerful shift in regulatory philosophy and it could signal much better days ahead for the success of the state's regulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, questions for the neutrals from committee? Seeing none, uh, Representative Armberger, do you have a question of one of the conferees? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, um, after Representative Howell's question and going into uh, the KDH&E uh, testimony, I have a question, if we can go back to the opponents. We can. Um, my question is for KDH&E. I just wanna make sure that I'm understanding. Um, 
how many departments are there within KDH and E, and how did you come up? I'm looking at your um, your math at the back of the the or the second page of your testimony. How did you come up with thirty to fifty FTEs are needed? Broken down among three different types of of employees, one would be uh, actually each division, uh, and this was an estimate of anywhere from five to fifteen. Um, to be real candid, that the one person who might understand the NRC regulations probably isn't going to be the same person who can understand the water regulations. Um, and, and so that's, that's the big float number, because if we go from 15 to 45 employees at approximately 45,000 uh, on an average, add a 32% for fringe benefits on top of that, and, and that's how that number was computed. In fact, that 32% is used throughout. In terms of attorneys, um, Currently, the agency has about three attorneys for each division. Um, my estimate was was that just to get ready for the 2024 uh, initial review, I would almost have to task one attorney for each division to do nothing but review the regulations. And quite frankly, whoever handles the environment, I don't know if they could do it. Uh, so that's why it's one to two attorneys for uh, additional to do this. Then there would be legislative liaison. Um, you know, to, to add the extra lift that would be in post. We have one current legislative liaison, and, and, as, and as bright and as talented as she is, uh, she's not going to keep up. So, so when you say, I, I'm looking, so um, it says five divisions, or at five per division. Are there five divisions within your agency, or? There's three divisions. Three divisions. Division, I'm sorry, I didn't understand your question. I apologize. Um, we have a division of public health, which is the oldest. Then it had division of environment, which had added. And then in 2011, uh, when the Kansas Health Policy Authority folded, we added the division of health care finance, which with the movement of the state employee health program uh, to the Department of Administration about two years ago, solely deals with Medicaid. Okay, and then the final thing I have is, um, I, I know your your uh, department has to deal a lot with federal regulations. We can't touch federal regulations, so I, I feel like that that's a argument that in the end, we, as a state, we're not going to touch them. So, well, and, and part of the reason why, be fair, the philosophy be, by why we entered into some of these cooperative agreements is is that we can attempt to negotiate with a federal regulatory structure for some items that would be maybe more specific to, to Kansas. Uh, um, water supply, um, now we have a series of regulations dealing with water supply, which are were written and we were allowed to carve out private wells as an example, or at least that's the example that uh, um, Mr. Henning was able to provide to me. So, but the short answer is, is no. I, I mean, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission comes in with a pretty heavy hand and says, do this. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yes, Dr. Dr. Epley. <laughs> Epley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And this, this question is really, this process question is for you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I really think this, uh, this bill has a lot of merit. I think a lot of us sitting here believe that, but this is relatively new information. And so if we need an amendment, given our timeline that we're tasked with, can that be accomplished by next week? I mean, this is just a lot to soak up. Our Senate colleagues, I don't think, heard this. I don't believe from what I'm understanding. And so what are your thoughts on that, Mr. Chair? Well, my thoughts are, is, uh, you know, the Senate worked it. They passed it out 37, 32 to 7. Uh, they did their due diligence. Uh, now we're having new opponents. And, you know, a lot of state agencies come in after it passes one body because then they think, well, it might pass. You know, and I, I don't blend that much value you know they need to get in at the beginning but uh so we're going to work this bill i mean i'm not going to work it today but this bill is going to be worked with uh rep the miller that did that so yeah just finish so you'd be receptive to an amendment on I'm, this i'm always not me personally you can yeah. introduce one and see how the committee well it's just we're on a short timeline i just didn't know thank yeah. you Mr. chair yeah. rep the high first then rep miller 
Representative Heiberg. Thank you. This was going to be a question from Mr. Vasquez, but it's more of a comment, so you don't need, you don't need to get up. But okay. my recollection is when I work, was working with KDHE about 20 years ago, we had a similar statutory requirement to review all of our regulations, and I did it. And it took, uh, took me most of a year for most of my time, but um, and that was 20 years ago, so a few statutes. But I guess I'm a little skeptical about your estimate for the FTE requirements, especially since all, all the regulation, all the statute requires here is a uh, summary of the regulations and a statement about whether they're still needed. So, okay. uh, and I, I guess I'm, I'm all the statute sorry. requires is a summary of the regulations and a statement of whether they're still needed. So I, I guess I question the estimate of 20 to 50 FTEs to do that, even though KDHE has about a quarter of all of our regulations. I'll need to think about that be fair, and, and, and I apologize to, to the committee. It's uh, one of the joys that I've had as I've gotten older is, is having to use hearing aids, and high ceiling rooms like this just do not work well with at least my hearing aids. Um, Representative Heiberg, I, I, I think it's, it's probably been mentioned by several others, a review of regulations is probably appropriate. In fact, uh, if you look at um, Agency 28, which is KDHE, we currently have about 77 articles. Um, um, this committee probably understands, but you, you, each agency is assigned a number. KDHE is 28. Um, and then we write topic areas called articles, like radiation has, is its own article. We have 77 of those articles just for KDHE. Um, there are about five or six of them that are not in active use that have been revoked. So somebody's obviously gone through and, and, and reviewed them. Um, part of the problem is, is that um, there might, in my own personal feeling, because I can't speak for the agency on this part, I think there's probably merit to always review your work product. Um, yeah. So, My recollection is that after that review, we discarded a handful of regulations. I believe that I recommended repeal of the mausoleum regulations, but that didn't happen apparently. So. Thank you. Uh, Representative Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Somewhat to follow up on both Representative Heiberger and the Vice Chair's line of questioning, and I don't know who can answer this, perhaps you, but there's a fiscal note on this bill, but it is obsolete given the dramatic change of the bill. We're, we're what is the, requesting a new one? Before okay, we're. that was my question. So we'll be requesting one as the bill is written now. And any idea when we might get that? Well, who do we, who do we request it from? Uh, we would request request it from uh, Jordan, the budget office, right? The budget office. <coughs> Thank you. Okay, but I intend on getting that before I work the bill. Okay, good enough. No further questions. I'm going to close the hearings on Senate Bill 34. The committee, a couple of announcements. If you've been paying attention to the weather tomorrow, uh, I still plan on having a hearing. I, I hope the school kids that were coming in can just WebEx in. I don't want them, because I understand north of us will be more snow than south of us. Uh, so I would ask that I've Spoken with Representative Garber and and uh, and uh, uh, Moser that uh, you know to encourage the kids to come in by WebEx. Uh, I, I just don't want them, and, and hopefully we will all be here. But it is a hearing, so you can WebEx in. Do not plan on working a bill tomorrow. Uh, however, if for some reason uh, this hearing tomorrow doesn't take place because the kids. They may not have school, so they may not have the ability to WebEx in. I will send out a new agenda today and some bills that we would work tomorrow. Uh, because we're not working Friday. Uh, we will be working all of next week, I, I think, because we're getting got a couple more Senate bills in and giving uh, priority to those. The bill that I introduced today will probably be worked uh, or at least heard next week. So uh, you just have to stand by. Uh, the agenda will be out today. Uh, I'll, I think there's two bills that we want to work. Uh, 
fairly quickly. So uh, that if we're going to do it tomorrow, I'm just going to send it out and alert you to it. We may not do that. A lot of it will be just dependent on the weather. So anything else or any questions from the committee about what I've proposed? If not, anything good for, for the good of the committee? Seeing none, we are adjourned.